Hi. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. What an honor to speak at Asia Society Hong Kong. And thank you, Alice, very much for that lovely introduction. And I must thank Selena Ting and Kobo for making this talk more public with a live Facebook posting. It's, um, my only concern is whether I look good. You know, I don't care whether the talk is significant or not, but is my makeup on right if I'm being broadcast? Oh, all right. All right, now I know that this works. So, um, I'm, <clears throat> I hope I can communicate with you tonight the delight and thrill I had in meeting these young women artists while I was doing research for my new book. They not only showed me their artwork, we didn't only do long interviews in their studios about the artwork. We ate dinner together. I went to music clubs together. They introduced me to their boyfriends that then became husbands, that then be they had children, all in the course of me writing this book. So though they were very young when I started writing the book, by the time I finished the book, they themselves were more established and more mature. And it was interesting to watch them grow into being full-fledged artists that I think are making significant contributions to the Chinese contemporary art dialogue. When I first started uh, learning about Chinese contemporary art, there were three women artists that I knew about, and that was it. Um, there was, seemed to be an endless list of male artists and very few women artists who were included in shows like the Inside Out show. One artist that penetrated my brain was Xiao Lu, who was most notorious for having fired a handgun at her work dialogue at the, at the China Avant-Garde show in Beijing in 1989. This was a work that had two phone booths with telephone in between them and as a commentary on um, relationships, Xiao, Yu did this, Xiao Lu did this violent act which immediately led to the show being closed at its opening and not reopened for a couple of weeks. So she was one artist that everybody knew about. The other artist who was in the Inside Out show, who I got to know early on, was Lin Tin Mao. And Lin Tin Mao made work that very much evoked female identity and Chinese identity, mainly by doing the act of winding thread around various objects. And she had learned thread winding as a child by her mother, and she then applied it to large-scale installations where every object, teapots, bicycles, um, beds, clothing, were wrapped in thread. In her more recent work, she's even taken to wrapping the human bones of a skeleton and showing that within a gallery. And it's all very meticulously done, very labor-intensive, and speaks to the domesticity, the domesticity of women's tasks and the banality and the mind-numbing um, tedium of many of domestic tasks. And the other woman artist who I knew in the 1990s was Yin Xu Jen. Here you're seeing her do her famous piece, Washing the River, which she first did in Chengdu in 1995, where she froze blocks of river water and then invited the public to scrub the blocks of ice until the water became clean as a commentary on pollution. She has done this in this activity at rivers throughout the world by now, but she's also very well known as a sculptor using soft fabrics, using fabrics from used clothing and sewing them together into these massive installations. And most recently, she had a mammoth figure of a person in a plane crashing at uh, Pace Beijing last summer. But the artists that I'm looking at are, are a new generation, those who've come up after 1976. And I use 1976 as a cutoff point because I wanted to look at artists that had not lived through the Cultural Revolution. 
and who were born after the death of Mao and who grew up with the open door policy, with globalization, I was really curious what being in a country that changed as rapidly as China from the 1990s to now, how that would affect creative people. And so that's what I was looking at for this new book, the creative people who came of age post uh, in the post Mao era. And so in terms of women artists, a pivotal figure is Sao Fei, who, as Alice said, has a wonderful installation right now at Taekwon. Um, now, Sao Fei is within the age group of this book, but she is a pivotal figure because she began her career at such an early age. She was beginning to be shown the minute, she, she, even before she graduated from art school. And one of the first works that she did upon graduation was this series of photographs called Cosplayers. And what she did was she discovered a subculture of youth in Guangzhou, where she grew up, who dressed as action figures in what is called cosplay. And she, what she did was she removed them from the kind of comic book conventions where they usually appeared and put them into natural settings in Guangzhou, in their apartments, in shopping malls, with their parents, and photographed this kind of juxtaposition between these futuristic people and the very contemporary daily settings of the city of Guangzhou. Um, and she then took the idea of cosplayers to the next level and went on to the online communities and um, she invented an avatar for herself named China Tracy. This is China Tracy, who appears in what's called Second Life, which are online communities where people create avatars and interact with each other, date with each other, buy real estate from each other, fall in love with each other, all uh, in these online communities. And China Tracy she tells a whole romance love story about China Tracy and this older man from Canada who con corresponded with each other online, had a kind of love affair, and then broke up. And she captured this all in a film called I Mirror. And this is the R&B city that Cao Fei created for her Second Life community. So you could go online to R&B City. You can still go online to R&B City and buy real estate. You can buy offices in the Pearl Tower or um, wander around the, the CCTV Tower or fly with pandas through the air. And um, all of this, you can um, rent bicycles, rent apartments, shop for clothes, all of this within this make-believe world, which uses real buildings out of China today. Now, Cao Fei, um, the question that always came to me when I was looking at these women artists, especially the millennial women artists, are, are they feminists? And that's one of the issues I'm going to raise today. Now, in terms of the way that they conduct their lives and their careers, I would say they're definitely feminists in that they are very determined. An artist like Sao Fei does not let obstacles get in her way. She's married, she has children. She has not let this stand in her career. And so in that way, as an American woman looking at the situation, I would say that she's a feminist. But what I've noticed with a lot of millennial artists, including Sao Fei, is that they're not making work specifically about a female experience. They're making work about experience impacted by globalization and the rise of the internet. And so the heir apparent to Cao Fei's work is Lu Yang, a young woman artist who lives in Shanghai, who also got started at a very young age. And one of her first pieces was this video that she made examining the, the collision between Buddhist concepts and um, 
neuroscience. Now, that's a stretch, you might think. But what she did was she took this Buddhist deity who is a god of wrath and dissected his brain and analyzed what was wrong with his brain chemistry that made him so angry and then suggests what psychotropic drugs he might be put on to ameliorate his bad mood. So um, Liu Yang also made this wonderful video game, fully operational video game called Uterus Man, where she has an androgynous figure who has superpowers that are all rooted in female reproductive organs. So, for example, he has an electric umbilical cord that he can zap his enemies with and radioactive fetuses that he throws at his enemies. And he rides around on a... a, a le- um, a nuclear pelvis that flies through the air. And you are challenged in the course of the game to pick up these powers yourself to help him fight off his enemies. Now, I use this as an example of a work that, again, instead of choosing to deal with the female experience per se, the artist is dealing with something that's like post-gender and is very fluid in terms of gender identity. And these artists are looking at identity in a whole new way, in a way that's much more fluid. So the way that in the United States now, many people are looking at the experience of being transgender or non-binary gender. I found that many of the young women artists in China are looking at identity either cultural identity or gender identity in very fluid ways as something that you can exchange at a whim and you don't have to be bound by how you were born. Lu Lang's latest video is called Delusional Mandela where she dissects her own brain and she shows you the process of her having her own brain analyzed Then she puts herself through a 3D printer and makes multiple copies of herself that are then dancing around. And then she ceremonially cremates her multiples and puts them in this multimedia hearse that has selfies of her covering the outside. And she does this. I mean, it's really hilarious. You're allowed to laugh. But also the serious questions she's asking are about what happens to notions of things like reincarnation if all we are is brain chemistry do we recycle that chemistry is that what we're talking about in reincarnation or what happens to reincarnation when we all have selfies that live indefinitely on the on on the internet are you know has the notion of a selfie replaced all other notions of reincarnation And this is how she installs her work when it's displayed in galleries. This was an installation she had at M. Woods. So it's not just a discrete video. She creates an entire environment to display the works in that are very much like entering a video arcade. Another artist who's equally influenced by the internet is Guan Xiao. Now, Liu Yang is one of the first artists who said to me, I don't live in China. I live on the internet. On the internet, you can be an avatar. You can be whoever you are. Nobody has to know if you're Chinese. And in fact, when I was interviewing a lot of the artists for the book, many of them rejected the label Chinese artists and were looking for other terms to express themselves. And Guan Xiao is equally an artist who's been influenced by the internet. What she does is she searches online for artifacts from various different civilizations and then puts them together in installations. So like this piece, um, she has African textiles and Polynesian figures mixed up with contemporary lighting stands and cameras. This is a close-up of one of them. She also makes humor sculptures, again, melding together artifacts from different um, time periods, different cultures, different countries, all together in one thing. And this is like what I would call um, 
what I call these audits is post-passport. And I talk about post-passport a lot in my book. But that doesn't mean that we don't have passports anymore, that we're not defined by passports. Obviously, I need a visa to come to China. They need a visa to come to the United States. But they aspire in their work to a way of life where we have transcended nationalism. And I think Guan Xiao is doing that very effectively in her work. This is an installation she had at the Hayward Gallery. The Screaming Woman is from a Beatles concert in the 1960s. And then she has a large overscale foot and modernist lighting in front of a scrim. This is the way it looked when it was installed in the gallery in London. Sui Jie is an artist who I met early on when she was just experimenting with painting at the very beginning of her career. And what she expressed to me at that time, and again, I couldn't see it in the work yet, but she soon developed into someone who was doing really interesting work. But at the beginning, everything was very fragmented and broken down. And um, But what she said was, having been trained in realist painting ad infinitum at the China at the Central Academy of Fine Arts she was looking for a way to create a painting that matched the china that she knew today a china that was juxtaposed modern and new modern and old um coca-cola and pagodas mao and kfc and how what kind, how, what, how would painting have to change? This was the question she was asking me. How would painting have to change in order to really capture what Chinese society is like now? And so she began making these kind of cubist um, compositions using real buildings that she knew from, her, from the Beijing landscape and I think also from Shanghai where she began. And these um, out-of-the-world 21st century um, forms intervening in the space. And I really appreciate these works even more, having seen where she was at the beginning of her career when she was struggling with realist painting and not really satisfied with what it was doing for her. And again, like Guan Xiao and Lu Lang, she's looking at China from a whole new perspective. And it, she's looking at it from the perspective of what, is, what does it mean to live in a society that globalized so fast that you don't even have attachment to your childhood home anymore because it doesn't exist anymore. So she's looking at the way that cities have been redeveloped and redeveloped time and time again until their origins are unrecognizable. And then there's Miao Ying, a young artist who lives in New York and Beijing, New York, New York and Shanghai. Miao Ying was a schoolmate of Lu Yang, and Miao Ying does all of her work online. So she created programs like this, Chinternet Plus. Um, Chinternet Plus is a promotional campaign in favor of the Chinese internet. What Miao Ying says is that Westerners always think that Chinese internet is a bad thing because of censorship. But what she's looking at is all the creative ways that Chinese people have learned to circumvent the censors. And she says that our internet, Chinese internet, is better than American internet because Chinese internet spawns creativity, whereas American internet, everybody just falls in line and uses it unconsciously. So Chinternet Plus was an ad campaign, a promotional campaign, promoting the wonders of the Chinese internet to a Western audience. She also makes these three-dimensional sculptures pulling images off online communities. Or she's made GIFs, um, one-second animations, based on images she finds on Chinese dating websites like this one of Lionel Richie. And most recently, she made this commentary at um, Freeze New York this year 
on the American political scene, mixing up Nicolas Cage and Donald Trump, demonstrating that Chinese artists, we always expect Chinese artists to comment on China's political situation. Westerners always bring that that prejudice to their questions of Chinese artists. What do you think about the politics? Are you commenting on the politics? And she's like, yes, I'm commenting on the politics of your political situation. Now, when I was writing the book, I specifically, there was a period where I specifically went out to find women artists who were dealing with the female experience. And what was very interesting in my conversations with them is though, by and large, most of them denied that they were feminists because they had a very uh, Chinese notion of what a feminist is. Many of them are making works about the female experience. So, for example, an artist like Lang Yangwei, Liang Yangwei, um, talked to me extensively about how she agrees with feminism in principle, but she doesn't believe that her work is feminist. Yet she's making work that um, comes to me very much out of communicating something about the female experience. She meticulously reproduces what textiles look like. So this piece, which looks like um, silk fabric, is actually meticulously painted oil paint, creating the patterns that she found in Shinazuri. And um, she is commenting on the economics of the textile industry. She's commenting on the laboriousness of women's activity in, and also that textiles are a female-dominated industry. But she's doing it by making these really ravishingly beautiful canvases. This is a more recent work where she is working with fine washes of oil paint instead of the deeply ingrained oil paint of her previous work. And again, she moved this way because she said she wanted people to pick up on some of the conceptual basis to the work and not just be so intrigued by her technique. And she's also done installations combining painting with furniture and other objects in the gallery. Now, According to what I know from American feminism, making work about textiles would automatically be seen as a feminist act because you're so imbuing something that is normally a women activity with the aura of fine art and you're elevating it to a higher level by doing that. But Chinese women artists don't necessarily see this as a feminist act. And that was an interesting contradiction to me. Another artist who I think I would characterize as definitely doing feminist work, though she might not agree to that label, is Machusha. The first work I saw of Machusha was this video in which she recounts for the camera her upbringing, her training as an artist from elementary school on. She tells the story of having a tiger mother who insisted, even when she was a young child, that she go for drawing lessons after school. And she said the moment that it was decided she would be an artist, her childhood ended. And she describes all of the things, all the lessons she had after school, when she was in elementary school, and then going to the feeder school of the Central Academy of Fine Arts, and then finally going to the Central Academy of Fine Arts, before leaving China to come to the United States to do graduate work and her guilt over leaving her family behind and coming to the United States. And at the end of the video, she removes from her mouth a razor blade and you see that she's been cutting her lip the entire time she's been speaking to communicate the torture that she feels she went through with that upbringing. More recently, Matusha made these, this series in which she uses women's stockings of the old-fashioned kind, the thick old-fashioned kind that she remembers from the 1980s, um, her mother and her female relatives wearing. 
and stretching it across cement um, and sewing them together as a statement. They look, they look like a landscape, but it's a statement on women's endurance and the fragility of those stockings um, when she's making this. And finally, most recently, she's been taking images from girly magazines, 1980s girly magazines that were found in China, underground in China, and taking images from them and transferring them to cyanotypes. And again, having you look at the female figure through different time periods. So you're conscious that you're looking at something that would have been considered erotic in the 1980s, and now we look at them and they're kind of beautiful images. And she's asking us to question what does desire mean at different time periods based on different political situations, different economic times, different points in history. One woman artist who's definitely making feminist work is Gao Ling, who's closely linked to the fem feminist movements in China. And a work she made early on was this one where she fashioned metal brown bras from colanders and had women go on the subway as a protest to sexual harassment on public places. And she um, took photos, advertised this online, and created a, a tremendous amount of community dialogue about these instances. Um, this is very parallel to some of the actions that feminists have taken that they would not necessarily consider art, works of art, but I definitely see them as performance art, such as women wearing bridal gowns being splattered with red paint to protest domestic violence, and women going on public squares with electronic signs saying, don't touch me, and things like that that feminist groups have done in China, not very successfully because they're shut down almost immediately, but they have an online life afterwards and a presence that generates dialogue afterwards. And Gao Ling's latest work is called Fog Series, which she's commenting on pollution throughout China by asking the public to post images of air pollution on her website and commenting on um, what they feel about pollution, what they think solutions are to pollution, and what kind of skies they see every day in places like Beijing. Now, another group of artists that I looked at while doing this book are Chinese artists living in the diaspora. And many of them don't even consider themselves living in the diaspora. They feel that they happen to be living someplace like New York City or Copenhagen, but that they're still Chinese. And one thing I definitely noticed is that these women artists were a lot more free about sexuality and uh, dealing with gender identity than their counterparts in China. So one woman whose work I really admire is Pixie Liao. Pixie um, went to undergraduate school, not in art, in Shanghai, and then came to the States for graduate school in photography. And she makes all her work with her husband, Moreau, and they're all re-examination of heterosexual dynamics. And they're very sexy, but they're also supposed to be very funny. You're allowed to giggle at these. And, um, and she's totally taking gender roles and turning them on her head. And she says that when I've talked to her about this, she says she could never have done this work if she hadn't moved to the United States because in China, there was so much pressure on her to marry and have children and marry a guy that was wealthier than her, that could provide a house, all of these things. Otherwise, you're considered a leftover woman. And in the States, she met Moreau, who's five years younger than her and is Japanese, and they're able to build a life for each other based on very different dynamic than she experienced with men in China. This is called homemade sushi.
And Shin Yi Cheng also is making works about heterosexual relationships, looking at her re relationships uh, now that she lives in the Netherlands with um, white guys, basically. This is a complete celebration of the beauty of white heterosexual men. And um, I met her when she was in New York and she was just at the beginning of this. And I was, I blushed a little bit at the overt sexuality in her work and the amount that she is able to convey desire. And again, this is work that I did not find women artists in China making work like this about subjects like this at all. Li Yuan was born in Beijing, but she lives now in Copenhagen. Um, and she's married to a Danish man. And all of her work has to do with globalization and the way that globalization has changed our very ways of communicating with each other. And she makes work that's very experimental. It's, photo it's photographic, but it's collaged in a way that um, challenges even the notion of showing a photograph in a rectangle because they're all different various shapes. And a piece like this, she would tell me, is all about conversation in that there is the couple in the middle having an argument with each other. But she also has two croissants kind of nuzzling each other in the right-hand side, broken pieces of pottery on the right lower-hand side, and pieces of a quilt on the lower left-hand side, talking about how different disparate elements come together. And she sees globalization as causing many, many different differences to both arise and fracture our ability to talk to each other, but also many commonalities, new commonalities found via the internet that assists us in our conversations. This is another one of her collages. This piece most dramatically demonstrates what she's talking about. Here she had friends of hers and colleagues come up with one sentence stories, one sentence conversations, one sentence stories. And then she printed them on felt and covered a room with them. So that you, it doesn't make any sense when you read them from one to one. It doesn't make one unified story, but each one intrigues you. You want to know more. And again, this is all about the way that thought is fractured given the impact of the internet and the way the internet has altered our attention spans, but also how a broad range of dialogue can take place on the internet, given that we can now cross all kinds of geographical boundaries in talking to each other. And this was a piece she did where she used botanical samples from various different websites and in between made up a fake diary account of a trip through Europe. So the text is all her different experiences in different cities, but this is all made up. It's like a fake diary. And the botanicals on view are also all made up because it's pieces of different plants put together to look like a single plant. And finally, the last person I want to talk to you about is C.C. Wu who is probably the youngest artist in the book. And Cici was born in Beijing, grew up in Hong Kong, and lives in New York now. And um, she's there with, that's not her boyfriend, that is a partner in a collaborative project called Practice that they run in New York, which is basically they provide a residency in a rundown apartment in Chinatown for artists, foreign artists visiting New York they give them a platform from which to um, exhibit their work temporarily, and they hold discussions and salons in that space. Now, Cici Wu is um, making very experimental installations combining film and objects. 
And often what she does is take not the actual footage of the film, but goes into a movie theater and records the ambient light of the film and projects that. So all you know is the title of the films that she used. You can't really see the content. And this is her way of communicating something about the impact of cinema on our psyches, that it goes beyond the content of the film, that it crosses cultural boundaries to reach us. This is the device she uses to record the ambient light in theaters. And this is the final piece I'm going to show tonight. What she did was she took two cuffs of a sweater, those two white objects are cuffs of a sweater, and they come apart and closer to each other because they're attached to an automatic door, the kind that when you approach it, it all opens by itself. Only this time, she made it that when you approach it, it closes so that they touch each other, or almost touch each other. And then as you walk away, they come apart from each other. And she said, this is a kind of love story where you never really touch each other. You, they never really meet. The two lovers never meet. They're always separating and trying to get close, trying to get closer, but never quite touching. And um, I like to use close with that because I think it is a way that I feel we come to understand the works of this younger generation of artists, especially the women artists, where we want to have almost didactic reasons for what they're doing. We want to have a complete explanation of what the work is about. But very often, they're working in a level of metaphor and um, analogies, which don't let you in on the complete story. They're suspicious of telling you the complete story. They're suspicious of revealing their identity to you. They're much more interested in setting up situations that challenge your own sense of identity and your own sense of being a viewer rather than letting you in on who they think they are or telling you what being Chinese or being a woman means. So this was all very interesting for me as I interviewed these artists and explored with them what their works meant. But I hope I've given you a little bit of a sense of what those works meant um, tonight. I know I didn't do as good a job as they did when I spent hours with them on end picking their brains and they generously cooperated with my interviews. But um, now I'd like to hear your questions, so thank you. Okay, Barbara, thank you for that excellent presentation. We're gonna open up uh, for questions. Peace. Don't be shy. Uh -oh. Catherine. And, um, thank you. Uh, the question is about Liu Yang's work, which you identified as having elements of uh, presenting um, Buddhist imagery and identities and neuroscience. So in your assessment, what is the artist's depth of understanding of both topics, oh. of Buddhism and neuroscience? OK. It's quite deep. When I first met Liu Yang um, about eight years ago, I, she had a studio um, in her apartment, basically, in a rundown section of Shanghai. And I walked up several flights of stairs and entered. And so you're, you have to imagine you're in this rundown building that's totally like 1970s China. And you enter her studio, and all of a sudden you're in the 21st century with scientific specimens and brain scans and <clears throat> multiple computer stations surrounding you. And already she was using internet chat rooms to be online and in dialogue with neuroscientists around the world. To create her work, she absolutely immerses herself in the most current research that's going on in the sciences, as well as being in conversation with animators from Japan, techno musicians from Britain. Um, it's totally an international practice. And she does not consider herself Buddhist, but she has uh, traveled extensively in Tibet and 
takes what Buddhism says and offers very seriously. So I don't think it's just a superficial mashup. Um, I th- I think uh, in talking to her, I can't follow a lot of what she's talking about because the science is above my head. Sure. Okay. Other questions? Well, I, I have a, a question for you then. In in terms of these artists, you've seen them grow. You 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 know when you first interview them, and up till now. And what has impressed you about them? I mean, you know, it just it seems like they are not, also they're not as well known yet. And is that, you know, ultimately what they're, you know, they're, they're practicing the art. I mean, obviously, um, even being in China, it's not a barrier. They're, they're, they seem to be kind of expanding or exploring this, some of the, you know, they're still operating. So what has been, what's been some of the stuff that you've been impressed by their growth uh, in, in your research? Well, one thing that really impressed me is that they are they do not spend time worrying about the obstacles to being an artist they overcome difficulties in a very determined way so much so that when i talk to them about whether feminism was needed in the chinese art world which i for one think definitely there is a need for it they would say no that they didn't that if you're a good enough artist it won't make a difference. But, and their experience was very different than the old, the generation that came before them where there was a lot of discrimination. I still think there's a lot of discrimination if you just count the numbers of how many women versus men artists are in the galleries in places like Beijing and Shanghai or Hong Kong. But um, they don't recognize this as an obstacle. So that is really what impressed me. And also the amount that they're willing to grow. I mean, these are artists that are, do not work at all like they're in isolation. Whether they can read English or not, they're on top of all the latest trends coming out of the West and are following what's going on worldwide all the time via the internet and um, wanna be part of that dialogue. Questions? What would be the major difference for you, um, for the Chinese women artists um, they are facing um, in their challenge as compared to the Caucasian, European, international uh, women artists? I, What I see is... Um, Well, one is, I think that whether they recognize it or not, it's still a really big challenge to get recognized as a woman artist in Asia. I think there's still a lot of formidable uh, prejudices against women artists here, and they seem to be overcoming that. But I would flip it around the other way. The way I look at it is that these artists have experienced the most rapid growth in a country that took place any place on the planet and are at the forefront of what we need to know about globalization. So I see them as having an advantage over artists in the United States and Europe because I find the work of artists in the United States and Europe very provincial at this point. And I find that the work that I'm seeing the Chinese women artists do much, much more open to the world and much more in dialogue with what's going on in the real world. But can you compare that to the Chinese Male artists, can, can, kind of contracts of their same generation, are they, are they similar? No, I think it's similarly, you know, that I see a lot more op- openness. But for me, um, some of the things that the women artists are saying, like Lu Yang about this kind of um, fluidity around identity, I think the women artists are doing that even more than the male artists. And so that's really interesting to me. Okay. Did you talk to these um, uh, women artists about where they will be in the next five or ten years and their views of their their, their works? So, um, any sort of thoughts around that? I mean, I, I'm sorry, I just can't hear you. Did you 
talk to them about their works in five or ten years, their, their future, their, their future outlook, where they will be. Um, did that come through in any way? In a way, I didn't because I was so absorbed with what they were doing now and because it's very hard for an artist to predict what their work is going to be like in five to ten years. That's a very long time. In fact, with a lot of these artists, I had to switch gears every single time I saw a show of theirs because things had changed so much from show to show. So I, but I, I would say that um, many of them were having a surprising amount of success on the international scene and were, from the beginning of me observing them to now, were showing much more internationally. And I think that they saw that as only increasing so that their view of um, the scope of their work was changing. Instead of thinking of it as only being for a domestic Chinese audience, they're now much more aware of it being for a global audience. And that, I think, is going to have an impact on their work. Um, but I'm not sure in what ways yet. Okay, Catherine. Remember here? Catherine? Yeah. Uh, this is just a topic of curiosity. Um, so you um, really enjoyed learning about the young women artists and feminism. Did you encounter any artists who talked about or confronted uh, an issue in China, female infanticide? I know of only one woman artist who made work about this, and she actually isn't in my book because she's a little bit older, and she lives in New York now. Her name's Zhang O, oh, and she made photographs of babies, young, like toddlers, in orphanages in China, and only women, or, um, only female toddlers. And so it's a very powerful statement on what's happening to that population in China. Um, but most of these artists weren't thinking about issues like that at all. Thank you. you know, I mean, that's like a lot of the broader feminist issues that feminists in China are raising didn't really penetrate this group of artists yet. Okay, thanks. Um, do you see these artists as exceptions or part of a growing wave of um, f female Chinese artists? Do you, is, are these, is this the kind of the tip of the iceberg for, for many more um, young artists coming uh, through, or do you? Yeah. This is clearly the tip of the iceberg because I could have put together a list of fifty or a hundred artists easily, and I mean, for every one of the artists that's on this projection today. I left out uh, quite a few. So, um, but this is the thing that I think I want more public awareness about. Now in the art schools in China, you have 50-50 men and women. Um, but as soon as you look at who's getting the first shows in galleries, who's being collected, a lot of collectors still say they won't buy women artists because they're going to get pregnant and have children and stop their career, which um, I can't tell you quite a few of these artists already have a child and are continuing their careers. But this, that, I think that what we should be concerned about is that drop off. What happens between art school and later career to so many of the young women who are being trained as artists in China, but don't emerge as artists. But I think that Increasingly, there should be pressure on people putting together group shows, for example, that there should be an equal number of men and women because there's an equal number of men and women artists around to choose from. And my understanding, art school, Central Academy, it's hard to get in. Yeah. Uh, in, in China. It's, uh, and so to be able to get in, even as a female artist, that's still quite an accomplishment then. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Back there. 
I, I wondered if any of the artists that you spoke to uh, expressed an awareness of the history of feminism in China and its um, relationship to the state. Uh, I guess in the West, a lot of um, millennial women do, I guess, express a resistance to the term feminism. They may consider themselves um, or believe in equality, but resist that that term feminism. But I guess in China, I mean, there's a very different history um, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, I just wonder if any of these young artists resist the term because of its kind of, um, yeah, that sort of implication with state ideology. Um, that is a really good question. That, and I should have covered that in my talk to begin with. Um, it's interesting, in the States right now, feminism is being revived as a term because of things like the Me Too movement and the amount of... Um, power that's being gathered around thing, a phenomena like that. In China, one of the reasons a lot of young women artists reject feminism as a term is because of the history of um, feminism during the Cultural Revolution, the equality of this, like an enforced equality of the sexes during the Cultural Revolution, and the amount of state-driven fe female shows of women artists so that they have all been exposed to s one or another really bad shows of women artists being put by some artist association or state-run agency. Uh, often they have the title Half the Sky, okay? So there's been like a million shows called Half the Sky that they've been exposed to that they did not like the quality of, and so they reject that. And so they're very suspicious of being identified as feminists or being included in shows that have that type of connotation because they see it as um, aligning themselves with government interests. And so that's an interesting wrinkle in that. Um, meanwhile, for the book, I interviewed quite a few feminist activists uh, of the, um, a few years ago, a group of five feminists were arrested for doing online activity. And they had very interesting things to say about how, how they're working to try to change the notion of feminism in China to make it seem more applicable to details of millennials' lives. But it's a, it's a really complicated issue. Um, I was really fascinated by it. Like, uh, and also the fact that a lot of strategies that work in the United States, like guilt tripping galleries to show more women, staging protests um, outside of galleries that don't show women, things like that that were done in the United States, I was told pretty roundly that this was not be available to women artists in China, and even if it was the galleries wouldn't change, that it wouldn't have the same kind of impact because there isn't the same kind of collective notion of equality going on here. So, um, okay. but that was really interesting to me.